Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Beth Seaton, Director of Sponsored Projects here at Western Illinois University. We're here at Kanabla Hall where we're going to visit Dr. Wynne Fippen from the School of Agriculture and hopefully uh, the Director of the School of Agriculture too. We're going to talk to Wynne a little bit about a new program that's been funded here at Western Illinois University. Hi Wynne. Hey Beth, how are we doing? Good. I wanted to come over and talk to you a little bit about your new project. Tell me a little bit about your new USDA project. It's so exciting. It's like a half a million dollars, right? Yes, it is. It's uh, it's uh, quite a coup for the the university and it is. Uh, my research program, and uh, I'm quite excited about it. It's uh, it's very unique. It's not a hardcore sort of science research project. It's more of um, plant breeding education and uh, with a component of science related to it. And the real neat thing about it, it has lots of opportunities for students. That's wonderful. So tell me how you're involving students in the, in the project. Great. Um, a lot of um, private seed companies, um, breeding seed companies, for, especially for corn and soybeans, are trying to get students re-energized about the field of plant breeding. And so this grant allows for students to do internship projects, and that's on the entire summer. Uh, time to work with these private companies. And so this year we have four interns. Uh, one's at Pioneer Hybrid, um, another one is over at Iowa State University, and another one's with the USDA in Peoria, and I have another one um, here at Western, and another one's at the University of Illinois learning about uh, bioenergy crops. Okay, tell me why plant breeding is important to the USDA and to the general population. Because I don't really know too much about plant breeding. Well, a plant breeder is the person who takes um, undomesticated plants. These are plants that haven't been considered for commercial production. Um, let's say a plant has a very strong sort of pharmaceutical properties to it. And we want to, um, instead of trying to synthetically make it in the lab, sometimes it's easier to have the plants produce these particular compounds. Okay. And so the plant breeder is the one that would go out into the wild, collect up the wild plants of these particular species, and then start doing some crosses and try to make different combinations of these plants to create a plant that would be suitable for commercial production. Okay. Um, and now on a more sophisticated scale, you know, the corn and soybean production has been around for a while and there's several plant breeders in the country that have actually been working on this, but they're simply trying to improve production practices. And so they could be simply improving the current hybrids for insect resistance or disease resistance. Every year new diseases come along. Um, soybean Asian rust is one that came back a few years ago. All our current varieties didn't have soybean Asian rust resistance in it. And so now they're looking back to the old wild populations to see if they can find that resistance in some old lines and cross it into today's hybrid lines. Okay, and why is it that Western is well positioned to be doing this sort of research? We're in the perfect location. We're, we're ideally suited in the middle of the Midwest. We're, we're right in the center of a lot of graduate level programs where students can go on and get master's degrees and say PhDs in plant breeding. And most of the seed breeding companies are located right here in the Midwest. Um, and so our students come in with a, a good agricultural background, and now they can get a, a, this, this grant as a, a new minor here in the department in the School of Ag. So you have a new minor in plant breeding? A new minor in plant breeding. Okay. And so that offers two new courses. One's in traditional plant breeding, and this is where we simply cross plants with each other. And it offers the new biotechnology plant breeding. And this is, um, you've probably heard about genetically engineering plants. This right. is where we can introduce DNA from other sources into plants to give us some unique traits. Cool. And this is where we can have plants um, resistant to herbicides and insects and things like that. Okay, so you've talked a little bit about the benefit to the students. Tell me a little bit more about your actual scientific research program that you're doing with this grant. Right. As you know, here in Illinois, uh, we produce a lot of corn and soybeans during the summer months. But the rest of the year, the fields sit empty. And so some researchers over the USDA in Peoria have come across, come across this crop that allows us to plant in the late fall after corn comes out, and it actually grows throughout the winter months. It, it gives us uh, field coverage, so we don't get a lot of uh, erosion in the fields during the winter months. So it's good for the field, too. It's excellent. That's wonderful. Right. So it's not only is it off-season production, but it also gives benefits back to the field for growing corn and soybeans. So when do you harvest this pennycress? Um, you'll plant it in late fall, and then sometime late May, 
uh, typically by the 1st of June, you would harvest this plant. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to then plant your soybeans right behind it, and there's no impact in on the soybeans. So they can get a full, soy, uh, full season soybean. Um, but what they're benefiting is they've produced all this pennycress. And what pennycress is being looked at, as you can see, it's a, a fairly small oilseed crop. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of oil. It's about 40% oil. And so the intent of this is simply to help displace a lot of petroleum-based products. Um, and that could be fuel. So this simply can be crushed to get out the oil to make a biodiesel product. Uh -huh. Or you can take this seed and add it to, say, plastics and other sort of petroleum-based products. Um, and it's not going to alleviate us completely from the dependency on foreign oil, but it's certainly the step in the right direction. It sounds like an exciting research program for Western. Yes, it is. Um, and what's exciting about it is because this grant involves students and research, the students get to be involved in sort of cutting edge research. Um, no other institution in the, in the country is looking at Pennycrest or looking at this sort of approach at off season sort of seed production. And so part of my job is to breed new varieties of Pennycrest. And uh, the big part of that is trying to produce more oil on these seeds. They're about 36% right at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get that up to say 40, 45%. And so a big part of this is trying to look into these seeds and finding out how much oil's in there. And how do so, you do that? Well, I, uh, we've hired a chemist, and uh, we have, uh, it's called an automated GC, or a gas chromatograph, mm -hmm. and it allows us to look inside these seeds to find out how much oil is. I actually have one next door if you want to go over and take a look. Yeah, let's take a look. All right, let's go. So come on in, this is the research lab, and this is where we actually extract the oil right out of the seeds. Um, Another grant that I wrote with the USDA allowed us to purchase a, an automated gas chromatograph, and that allows us to actually look at the oils inside the seed. And so the first thing we have to do is actually count these seeds. And so we, you count these little teeny seeds? These tiny little seeds. Okay. And we'll, and we'll count about 50 to 100 of them, and we'll place them in a glass tube. And then we add some hexane, and we grind it up. And what you can see is the, the white part here at the bottom is the pulp of the seed, and that's where the oil is. Okay. And what that oil will do is actually migrate up into the, the extraction layer here, and then we'll suck that little clear part off and place it into a GC vial. And once the liquid's in here, we have a, a computer that can control this robot, and it applies a sample on every 24 minutes. Um, because this is automated, we can run anywhere from... Um, you know, 900 to 1,000 samples within a week, and it runs 24 hours a day. Why would you run 900 to 1,000 samples? Well, if you're breeding plants, you're not quite sure which one has the components that you want. So when I, I make a cross, I've got all these young seedling plants, and I'm not sure which one I'm interested in. Okay. So I have to collect seeds from each individual plant. Every single plant? Every single plant. And that's why you keep these numbers right? And I've got to keep every <laughs> single vial uh, together. Okay. Once we have the sample in the vial, there's a robot here that's controlled by the computer that will inject a sample every 24 minutes. So as soon as the sample goes in, it actually enters into a very long glass tube. It's about 30 meters long. And so if it's a very large molecule, it's going to move very slowly. If it's a very small molecule, it'll move through fairly quickly. Okay. When it gets to the very end of that tube, there's a flame there, and it's going to burn off this molecule. And depending on the intensity of the fire that's created because that molecule comes out at that time, creates a signal. And that allows us to determine not only how much oil was in the plant, but the specific components that actually make up that oil. So let's take a look at the computer here. And so this is the controller. And this controls where all the vials are and keeps track of all the numbers. Um, I, I can have, I know where all my samples are. I know how much um, material's in those samples and when it's going to be run. And after the sample is run, I get what's called a chromatogram. And simply it's a graph of this is the signal strength over time. And so I inject my sample here, and as it goes through, every time I get a peak, that tells me that's a compound that's coming to the end of that glass tube. And so this tells me all the different compounds that were actually in my seed oil. Okay. Now, as a plant breeder, you're, well, how do we make sense of this? Mm -hmm. All right, what I know is I know what compound this is at, this, at the two-minute time period, four-minute, or six-minute time period. Well, let's say I'm trying to create a biodiesel product that doesn't create as much smoke or maybe doesn't gel up under very cold conditions. Right. So what I would look for is plants that have very high uh, of this compound and perhaps something low in this compound. I see. And so I can alter the, the relationship of these different constituents within the oil. 
And so that's the exciting thing about pennycress. It's, it's a brand new crop. No one's actually done much research on this particular crop. And so the, the possibilities are endless on pennycress. And, it, and it's exciting to have students involved in this right. type of project. And uh, the employment opportunities is tremendous. Um, you're, you're starting to see a lot of um, companies talking about green energy and uh, green production. Yes. And so these students are going to be just positioned very well in terms of getting positioned at these companies on uh, looking at new crops and breeding new varieties and things like that. It's really exciting that we have these opportunities for our students here in Macomb, Illinois. And I really appreciate you showing me your lab and talking to me a little bit about your project. That's great. Anytime. Um, you know what? Later on this week, we're actually having a field day about pennycress. Um, it'll be out at the research farm, and it's an opportunity for not only producers, but say potential students and other students to come out and see what we're doing out in the field. So, okay, great. Um, I'd love to come out if you'd be willing to show it to me. I'd love to. Make sure to bring your boots. Okay, Should thanks. Should be fun. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. We're um, this is the field plots for the pennycress research. Uh, we've got several studies out here. Uh, the one to the north here is a planting density and planting method study where we're trying to answer the question of how many seeds do we need to put in the ground to get a decent yield. And we're looking at a half a million, a million, and two million seeds per acre uh, drilled. And then we're looking at broadcasting where we just toss it out on the ground. Okay. An another big question is simply um, uh, determining when in the fall we need to plant so I have successive planting dates starting at September 1st all the way up here to November 30th um, and looking at, you know, what is the best time to plant? Can we do it right after corn? Okay, so this is the, the pennycress is, is the, the um, crop that you're using to put into the field um, in the alternate season. So you're still going to have um, corn or beans and then this goes in afterwards? Um, yes, typically on pennycress we would follow corn. So you would plant after the corn comes out. Uh, then this will form a rosette, uh, just a bundle of uh, leaves uh, into the fall. It'll overwinter just fine and it'll start flowering in early spring. And it'll be at this stage by the end of May. And you'd hope to harvest that first week of June. And then you'll plant a full season soybean right behind it. Okay. And so the real niche for this crop is growing off season crop production. It's called double cropping. Um, and this is what the field day is going to be about tomorrow. People are going to come out so they can learn more about pennycress and what you're doing out here. Absolutely. We're, we're trying to answer all the basic questions you would on any sort of new crop you're introducing. Um, because this is strictly for the biodiesel market, uh, we're not making a feed crop or anything like that. It's strictly for off-season biodiesel production. So we're, we've got a lot of studies out here um, we'll, we'll look at in terms of uh, what kind of nitrogen does it need? What's the planting date, planting density, planting methods, uh, the pollination systems? Um, how much, what role do bees play in pollinating this particular crop? We'll look at what is the impact of pennycress on soybeans, which is a, a crop that would follow pennycress. And we'll have a chance to take a little look, look ah, have a chance to take a look at all that uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll offer coffee and donuts. Great. And it starts at 10 a.m. and finishes at noon, rain or shine. Are your students going to be out here helping you tomorrow? Yes, they sure will. A lot okay. of students, they play a big role in trying to do these research plots, and they, they learn how to um, develop a plant breeding program and develop a crop from, from essentially a weed. Who is um, invited to field day tomorrow? Um, the, the intent is really to introduce pennycress to the general public. Now, we've invited fellow researchers over in Peoria that have been working on the crop and in and industry folks that have a vested interest in pennycress in the biofuels area. They'll be over to talk about what they're up to in terms of building a biodiesel plant. And um, local growers that have had a chance to sort of play with it and they'll give us some feedback on how well it went and, and some of the challenges they're facing in growing the crop. Okay, well, we'll be back tomorrow to um, look at your field day. I hope the weather holds out for us. It sure will. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got some growers, some sales folks, uh, a lot of analytical support and chemistry support from the USDA. Um, I'd like to begin today first by introducing Terry. Uh, Terry's already introduced himself. And it was the USDA in Peoria that sort of came up with the idea of uh, working on pennycrest. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how they got started and where they are now in the research side of things. But before we get to Terry, I'd like to introduce our our overhead. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bill Bailey, he is the uh, director of the School of Agriculture, and he has some welcome words, I guess. Uh, words of welcome. Uh, <laughs> big decision uh, I was involved in is whether or not to have coffee or cocoa or chili today. <laughs> uh, we opted for the coffee. Welcome. Uh, you're part of a historic event, uh, truly historic. This is the first Pennycrest field day ever in history of the world. 
right here at Western <laughs> Illinois University. Oh, <Owen. laughs> <laughs> So, cutting edge stuff. No, we're very pleased uh, you took the time to come here and share some of Wynn's work with him. It's exciting stuff, it's new stuff, it <laughs> continues the tradition that he has started here at Western of uh, looking at new ways and new crops to help uh, Illinois farmers uh, make money. So, I'll turn it over to you, Wynn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'll try to pass on to Terry. Uh -huh. I do this, this, is a, this is a fun project because, as Brad knows, my, I've got one answer. I don't know. <laughs> I stick with it really well, don't I, Brad? Yes, you do. Uh, we started working on this probably in about 2002. We saw it as an opportunity to develop a crop locally. It really volunteers in all of our fields. If you drive around, it's really easy to see right now. It's, it's going to be turning yellow. You can go down the road, down the interstate, 65 miles an hour and you can pick it out once you see it a couple times. Uh, so it's easy to see, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. It's all across the Midwest and it stretches into Canada, down into Texas, it's very widespread. It originated in this country probably with, with wheat, as a contaminant in wheat, and that's why you see it so widely dispersed. So we're not the discoverer of it, we just saw an opportunity to, to take that plant and do something with it. So it has very high oil, it's 36% oil, uh, in the variety that we're working on. It's a very small seed, as, as you've seen this morning. Uh, and it, it does dry down, so it's determinant. It has a lot of good things going on in a crop that you want right out as a wild crop. And usually you have to work to get those things. It doesn't really seed shatter. Uh, it will after a while. That's how it gets dispersed. But it's usually several weeks after it's ripe that you'll start to see the seed shatter. So it'll hold on to seed so you can get it in the combine and do all the things. And so these things seem all easy, you know, when you talk about them, but when you work on a new crop, these things aren't easy to get to that point. So this thing started way ahead of every other new crop that we've ever worked on at the lab. And you have to bear that in mind. It may, it may take tens of years to get to the point where Pennycrest started. And so Wynn's got an opportunity to really take that and move that forward uh, quite a bit and, and make some real advancements. He doesn't have to conquer all these, these small problems small problems <laughs> that usually are associated with crop. This had to be done in soybeans. I mean, these things had to be done in corn. I mean, if you think about the effort that goes on in, in corn and soybean today in terms of the breeding effort, I mean, you are looking at the breeding effort that's going on right here in Pennycrest. All right, well, welcome everybody. It's nice to see everybody. It's great to finally meet Hannah. <laughs> and welcome to the prom. <laughs> um, if you guys don't already know, I'm Dr. Wynn Fippen. Um, and then what um, we're doing today, essentially, is giving an opportunity for the interns to come back from their summer projects and sort of report back on what they did all summer long, um, what they did for the money, <laughs> and uh, tell us all about what they've learned. And uh, then hopefully we'll have a chance to talk to some of the advisors and the professors and giving us some feedback. And we definitely want feedback from the students on how we can Im improve the program. Um, the grant this is all part of um, is trying to create opportunities for students to get interested in the field of plant breeding. Um, and so we're going to be offering these internship programs for the next three years. Um, and we'll have some opportunities to even create other opportunities and doing summer internships, not only at, at Pioneer, at the University of Illinois, Iowa State, and over in Peoria, but also some um, summer work positions here on campus during the summer and during this, the, the school semester. Um, and so today really is, is an informal time for the student, informal, so don't get too nervous, <laughs> to uh, present 15 minutes or so of what you've learned on your particular projects. And I think what you'll find is you all worked on, you know, in plant breeding or in plant production areas, but you all worked on very different crops, um, you know, from chemistry to uh, corn breeding to Hannah's variety of different things. And then later on, we're going to hear from Victoria, our Iowa State person is coming in on Amtrak, and they won't be here until 11. Um, and then she's going to talk about the George Washington Carver program that she did over at Iowa State with uh, Candace Gardner with the, the plant induction station. Um, my research at the lab focused on um, analyzing the percent of oil and moisture and fatty acid content of pennycress. And um, several studies were conducted while I was there, including um, a position of the seed location on the plant determine how much oil had and um, different herbicides were used on the plots and variety trials conducted and some other studies. Pennycrest is a winter annual and the seeds for Pennycrest contain a very high oil 
percent. This crop is easily grown and harvested with minimal effects on soybean production. And Perry concluded that if Pennycrest was planted in all U.S. soybean fields off-season at 1,000 pounds per acre yield, it could produce about 3.8 billion gallons of additional biodiesel. And um, the remaining meal can also be used as an organic fertilizer and natural weed killer for low acreage high value crops. It's also a source of monomer for bio-based plastics. Hi, Hannah. Um, tell me a little bit about your internship this summer with Dr. Fippen. I understand you were working on his U.S. Department of Agriculture grant? Um, yeah, I got to work at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign with small grains, so wheat and oats, and um, got to do a lot of data collection on um, trying to find the best variety of wheat and oats, and uh, lots of work out in the field. But So are you okay. a student at the University of Illinois? Yeah, I'll be transferring there in the fall, so I'll be a junior in the fall. Oh, that's great. So what would you, uh, what kind of advice would you give to anybody who's considering um, some this sort of agricultural internship? I would say definitely go for it, because like, I didn't know anything before I started, and um, so I got to learn a lot about different crops and got to get some hands-on experience before I started in the fall. Hi, Victoria. Did you work here at Western Illinois University or somewhere else? I worked at Iowa State University and I worked for the plant introduction station on their Iowa State University. And this was on his U.S. Department of Agriculture grant, correct? Yes, it was. So were you working with Pennycrest too or were you working with a different crop? I was working with a biofuel plant called Camelina mm -hmm. and I was basically taking the dimorphic differences, which is the difference in the leaf shapes and uh -huh. the morphologic measurements of Camelina. Tell me about your internship. What would you say was the most exciting part of it for you? I got to work a little outside my major. I'm a biology major and chemistry, and I'm focused more on the animal aspect. Mm -hmm. But I got to work more with the plant aspect of it, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it. Hi, Josh. Hello. Um, tell me a little bit about your internship that you had um, with Dr. Fippen's USDA grant this summer. Okay, I work for uh, Pioneer Hybrid International out of Adair, Illinois. Um, I worked under plant breeder Dr. Mark Hoffback, mm -hmm. and I reported to Bruce Edson. He's a senior uh, research associate for Pioneer. And my project was related with nitrogen use efficiency corn hybrids. Um, the field that I worked with was flooded out not once, not twice, but three times. And if you go there today, there's only soybeans that high. So, in other words, we had to contact other research stations uh, around the Midwest and, and go to their nitrogen use efficiency plots and and get collect our data. Mm -hmm. So I went to Marion, Iowa, Princeton, Illinois, and Johnston, Iowa, which is Pioneer's world headquarters. And I collected my data from their locations. Okay. So what would you say was the most exciting thing about your internship this summer? Um, the most exciting thing was to, uh, to work with uh, very smart, intelligent people that uh, know a lot about the, the maize or the corn crop. Mm -hmm. And most of all, they have, they're passionate about it. They really like uh, what they do and, and make me like what I do. And uh, I, learning from them people is worth more than the paycheck every week or learning them people and most importantly meeting them people for down the road, future mm -hmm. references for possibly a job after graduation. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks Thank a lot you. for talking Thank with you. us. And it's at the, Hi, Bill. Know. Hello, Beth. I was just upstairs talking to Wynn uh, Fippen, and he told me I could find you down here. Um, I'm over here talking to him about his new USDA grant, so I thought I'd just ask you a couple questions if you've got a couple minutes. Certainly do, and welcome to our Ag Mech Lab. Yeah, I've never been in here before. It smells like an Ag Mech Lab. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about what a grant uh, like Wynn Fippen's means for your department. Oh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for Wynn, for uh, School of Agriculture, and for our students. Uh, it, it means a lot because it puts us on the cutting edge of a lot of the research which is going on in plant breeding. And more importantly, it gives students an opportunity to work with WIN, who will teach them plant breeding techniques, and they will apply what they learn in class under his supervision.
he seems really excited about his program. And when I'm talking to him about it, um, you can just see that enthusiasm come out. I've talked with a lot of other um, ag faculty, faculty from your department um, in my role as the director of sponsored projects. You have a lot of faculty members who are involved not only in um, teaching in the classroom, but also heavily involved in, in research projects. Uh, we certainly do. And it's that blend of research and teaching, which I think is a real hallmark of the School of Agriculture here at Western, because the faculty members are doing their scientific research bringing it into the classroom themselves. They are the teachers and they are the researchers. Uh, for example, here in the Ag Mech uh, lab, uh, the students uh, put on the Ag Mech show under the guidance of the, uh, our Ag Mech instructor. And that's every February? Every, every February. Right. Uh, but it's student, the largest student run event uh, in the country. And, wow. And so uh, the students uh, take full advantage of those opportunities. They learn a lot from it also. That's right. You have um, a lot of um, international type of things going on in the department also, don't you? Oh, we, we certainly do. Uh, for many of our students, uh, they have not had the opportunity to go overseas. Some of them, frankly, have not even been to Chicago or on an airplane. Wow. But we take them uh, and have taken them to China. Last year it was to Australia. We have a trip to Brazil coming up, a uh, trip to Russia, which is very successful. And the students uh, understand that it opens up a whole new world for them, which they were not aware of before. I remember reading um, in the newspaper about your trip that you took to Australia. You were on that trip, yes, weren't you? Yeah. I was surprised at how many students you were able to take with you. It's, it's always a concern because uh, the students pay for it themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep the cost as low as possible, but the, at the end of the day, it is, it is a wonderful experience and the students uniformly Get their money, get their money's worth, and we have many students who will go on every trip we offer. Thanks for taking time to talk with me today about some of the things going on in the Department of Agriculture. Thank you very much for dropping by, Beth. We enjoy sharing all of our activities with you. And thank you for joining us today on Spotlight.